to this month's A to Z of Tudor Places with me, Sarah, the Tudor Travel Guide. Now, just as I bent the rules a little with our foray into Scotland when we explored Scottish locations that had a bearing upon the Tudor history through their associations and connections to Mary Queen of Scots, so today I intend to do the same but with a slightly different emphasis. This time we will be exploring the northern stronghold of a family whose fate was intimately bound up with that of the Tudor dynasty. Yes, my friends, today we are travelling to the north of England and the wide open, rugged and beautiful landscape of North Yorkshire to explore the historic architecture and relevance of Midlam Castle to the Tudors. So today in this video we're of course going to be talking about Midland Castle, the location and the history associated with it. But if you want to read the show notes associated with this A to Z and find out a little bit more about some of the treasures that have been dug up from the ground around the castle including the fabulous Midland Jewel, then make sure you check out the blog associated with this podcast. I'll also make a link in the description below. So if you want to stick around and then follow the blog, that's the way to do it. Okay folks, so let's carry on with our story. If you don't know much about Midlam and perhaps you're coming across this building for the first time, well Midlam Castle was one of the principal homes of Richard III, the younger brother of the Yorkist King Edward IV. It was his favoured residence from 1471 until he ascended the throne 12 years later in 1483. Thus, although Midland Castle was not used by the Tudors, in the run-up to the decisive Battle of Bosworth, in which, of course, Henry Tudor would finally seize the crown from the Yorkist king, Richard would reside at the castle at Midlam. And in fact, his only son and heir, the so-called Edward of Midlam, big clue there, would live and die there. Well, let me begin, therefore, putting Midlam Castle geographically in place so that you might get your bearings, particularly if you're unfamiliar with English geography. Today, Midlam is a small market town in the county of North Yorkshire, and the town lies about 230 miles north of London and about 45 miles northwest of York, North Yorkshire's principal city. Now, our favourite Tudor antiquary, uh, John Leyland, travelled around England in the 1530s and he visited Midlam. And he described his approach to Midlam as part of his 16th century travels, which, of course, are known as John Leyland's itinerary. And he writes that having left Richmond, which is another nearby market town of some note, and after a mile of difficult and rocky terrain, he rode for a further seven miles across moorland with few trees in sight until he reached the town of Midlam. And even today, 500 years later, as you drive through the Yorkshire Dales, as the area is known, you'll often feel that sense of open expansiveness and endless fields marked out by the crisscrossing of dry stone walls. However, upon arrival, Leyland described Midlan as being a pretty market town which standeth on a rocky hill, on the top whereof is a castle neatly well dyked, i.e. with a, uh, a moat, uh, with the castle joining hard to the town on the south side. We have another early description of the terrain surrounding Midlam, in fact, and its castle, and that comes from a, a chap called Francis Gross, who wrote an account called The Antiquities of England and Wales in the late 18th century, so a couple of hundred years later. And he notes that Midlam stands just seven miles from another historic northern castle, and that's Bolton, which, of course, where Mary Queen of Scots was in prison in the 1560s. But he also said that Midlam has the superior advantage of distinctly commanding the wood, and the finely scattered villages, and the lazy progress of the river 
ye, ye, sorry, that's U R E, ye, through the spacious meads or meadows on the eastern part of Wensleydale. Now, let's get to a little bit more about the origins and the history of Midland Castle. Well, Midland is a castle which grew out of the Norman conquest of England. Originally, there was a wooden structure and that was replaced by a later stone structure, the current castle, whose construction was commenced in the 12th century. However, it would not be until the 14th century under the powerful Neville family that the castle would reach its pinnacle. If you look at it today, one of the most dominating features is its massive central keep and that was constructed around 1170, the subsequent 300 years seeing intermittent modernisation and improvements to the castle, including the raising of the castle's curtain walls and the construction of a series of lodgings built inside and around three sides of the courtyard. Now this was possibly inspired by the swanky new building project going on at nearby Bolton Castle, which incorporated a number of completely new innovations in castle architecture for the time. And that is perhaps said to have inspired the Neville owners of Midlam to improve their facilities, I guess in order to keep up with the Joneses. Nothing changes. So just what did the Neville's formidable Wensleydale home look like? Well, happily, as today's castle ruins are extensive, accurate reconstructions of how the castle appeared in its heyday are possible. Essentially, we have that massive central square keep, which I mentioned before, which dominates the castle's site. Now, that keep was slit centrally down the middle by a dividing wall, which created two parallel chambers on either side. Much, in fact, as you can see surviving at Dover Castle today. On the ground floor were the kitchens and the service offices, while on the first floor there was the Great Hall, accessed by an external staircase that clung to the eastern wall of the keep. And then on the other side of that central stone divide were two chambers. A Great Chamber, which was the slightly larger of the two to the south, and that seems to have led to a more private inner chamber sited to the north of the Great Chamber. Now there was also a chapel at that first floor level and that was accessed off the staircase which led up to the Great Hall, again at first floor level. Externally, if you look at any reconstruction of the castle, the chapel can be seen protruding out from the keep's east wall and next to the main entrance to the castle's inner courtyard, which was on the east side of the castle. Now, throughout the castle's history, the keep continued to serve as the main focus of entertainment and reception around which all life at the castle revolved. The other major feature within the walls, within the curtain walls of the castle, are the extensive range of single and paired lodgings, and they ran around the north, the south, and the west wall of the castle's curtain walls. Now, all of those had garderobe facilities, toilets in other words, and fireplaces, and provided lodgings of various status to accommodate the lords, household, friends, and guests in what would have been the height of medieval luxury and comfort. The grandest of those lodgings were at the first floor level and the ceiling heights were taller than the lodgings below. And again, this just serves to highlight the superior status of those rooms. And so they must have therefore have been used by the most senior persons occupying the castle. One of these first floor lodgings on the south side was particularly grand and it even had its own hall. And this suite was the one that could be accessed via an elevated covered bridge which led directly over from the keep. And this close communication suggested that only the most honoured guests would make use of such accommodation, perhaps even the Lord or his family himself. I guess it's a bit like being given the modern penthouse suite if you're staying in a hotel. Anyway, in April 1537, actually after the Pilgrimage of Grace, 
orders were given to repair the castle, i.e. in order to receive the king, that of course being Henry VIII. Although eventually he never actually stayed at the castle or in fact went anywhere near it during his 1541 progress to the north. Nevertheless, the castle was surveyed in 1538, perhaps in preparation for such a visit, and many distinct rooms are listed in the subsequent inventory. But perhaps most interestingly for us is the mention of a nursery in the southwest corner tower of the keep. Now, just maybe it is postulated that this is where little Edward of Midland was raised, although, as far as I know, there's no distinct proof of the like. Now, as you will know, one of my favourite architectural historians is Anthony Emery, and if you tune in regularly to these A to Zs, you'll know that I refer often to his works. And he makes a statement in his great work, The Greater Medieval Houses of England and Wales, that the layout and grandeur of the castle's lodgings at Midlam make a rich architectural statement about the graded high-quality accommodation that was required for any leading landed magnate of the early 15th century. So, interesting from that point of view. Now, what of the history of the castle? How did Richard III come to be associated with it? Well, of course, the Nevilles, and in particular Richard Neville, Earl of Warwick, who is popularly known as the Kingmaker, were instrumental in helping Edward, initially Earl of March, to ascend the throne in 1461 as the new Yorkist king, Edward IV, having deposed the Lancastrian king, Henry VI. There were family ties involved, so Richard Neville and Edward IV were cousins. Now, when his elder brother, Edward, became king, the future Richard III was just around nine years old, and he was sent to live in the Earl of Warwick's household at Midlam in 1465 in order to receive an education befitting an aristocratic gentleman. Now, Warwick was considered one of the most accomplished military leaders of his day, and so I guess it would have been a fine education indeed. Now, I also just want to mention that Edward IV himself stayed at Midlam uh, with his Neville cousin for a few days in 1461, so the year of his accession. However, as is often the way with families, Richard Neville eventually fell out with his cousin, Edward IV. Now, Richard Neville, for a short period of time, had the upper hand, and Edward IV was briefly imprisoned at Midlam before escaping while out hunting in one of its parks. But, ultimately, when Richard Neville was defeated and killed by Edward's army at the Battle of Barnet, his little brother, Richard, was given the title Richard of Gloucester, and some of the estates, including Midlam, and another enormous property at Sheriff Hutton Castle just outside York. One year later, Richard was to marry Neville's younger daughter, Anne, and Midland remained an important base from that point for the new Duke until his death in uh, 1485. Anne, in fact, would give birth to their only child at Midlam Castle, who, as I mentioned at the top of this film, was known as Edward of Middleham. The young lad was to be raised at the castle and in fact lived to see his parents crowned King and Queen of England. How thrilling at the time it must have been. But unfortunately, Edward was to die at the castle in April 1484, just a year before his father. The Croyland Chronicle, which is an important source of English medieval history, states that with regard to his death, in the month of April, on a day not far distant from the anniversary of King Edward, this, his only son, Richard's only son, in whom all the hopes of the royal succession was seized with an illness but of short duration and died at Midland Castle. On hearing the news of their son's death, the king and queen were then in residence at Nottingham Castle, 
and if you had been there, you might have seen his father and mother in a state of almost bordering on madness by reason of their sudden grief. Now, interestingly, we are going to be hearing a lot more about this latter location. That is Nottingham Castle in our next month's A to Z, so do stay tuned, folks. But in the meantime, back to our story. So when Richard III was slain at Bosworth in August uh, 1485, all his estates, including Midland, were forfeit to the crown. And in fact, Richard's death knell was shared by one of his favourite residences. And thereafter, sadly, the castle fell into disuse. Okay, so that is a potted history of Midland Castle. Now let's talk about visiting the castle and the surrounding area. As I have mentioned, the ruins of Midland Castle are substantial. And since this place was once the epicentre of the York's last stand in England, is well worth including on your travel itinerary. So as I mentioned, Midland Castle is sited in a part of Yorkshire called the Yorkshire Dales, in fact, Wensley Dale, and it's very beautiful, uh, open, rugged, as I've mentioned, countryside. Um, but this means it is in the middle of nowhere. So you do need to probably have a car to get around easily, particularly if you want to combine your visit to Midland with some other historic locations in the area, which you will want to do, and I'll talk about those in a moment. Midland itself is a little market town, pretty little market town. There are cafes and pubs, etc., so you will be able to get rest and refreshment. And the castle lies just adjacent to the town. In fact, part of the town has been built on one of the castle's old outer courtyards. You can't see it today, but it's, it's engulfed it, so that it literally, the castle sits right adjacent to the town. So you do not need to travel anywhere, any distance at all to reach the castle from the centre of Midland. And by the way, this area is renowned for its racehorses, so don't be surprised if you are have to give way to a whole, um, a whole stream of racehorses that come trotting through the middle of the town, particularly if you're there in the early morning uh, when they're exercising the horses. It's quite a sight. Now, Midland Castle itself is run by English Heritage, so you can find out all about how to visit, the current costs for visiting, uh, if you visit their website, and I will put a link to that in the description below. Note for those of you who maybe are wanting to combine a number of English Heritage properties within your visits to or around England, uh, English Heritage have a visitor's card, and getting a card particularly maybe one way of saving a little bit of money on your travels. So the other thing I wanted to mention is other places that you might want to visit that are directly in the vicinity of Midland Castle within, within a few miles. Uh, one, of course, I've already mentioned, and that's Bolton Castle, which lies just seven miles or so up the road and is associated with Mary, Queen of Scots. Again, these are substantial ruins, and they're in fact the whole wing that was used by Mary, Queen of Scots is still intact, and you can go and visit those rooms. That, again, is highly recommended. Uh, in the other direction, I think it's to the southeast, you have uh, the ruins of Jervo Abbey. Now, Jervo, of course, was lost during the dissolution of the monasteries, and the ruins are impossibly romantic, and I absolutely love visiting there, particularly in the summer, when you get a roses tumbling over the crumbling walls. And there are unlikely to be very many people around, so it's very atmospheric and a great place, actually, to take a little picnic. So that's a couple of places in the vicinity that you might wish to visit. And, of course, not too far away, you have the fabulous medieval city of York, which you might want to make your base if you want to travel out into the Yorkshire Dales and see the properties that we have mentioned in this film. So I'll include some links to all of those uh, different properties and places in the description below. 
and that therefore concludes our A to Z for this month so I hope you've enjoyed it and if you haven't been to Midland you are now inspired to go and taste a little bit of Yorkist history but until next month where as I said we'll be diving into the austere and formidable fortress that was Nottingham Castle all that remains for me to say as ever is happy time traveling Thank mm -hmm. you.